Welcome to The Conversation. My name is Athena, and I will be your host for this first segment. I am also joined by Jade, our cosplay cosmologist, as well as Mike, our rocket specialist. And we have Dada behind us, who will be producing the show. And today in news, we have... NASA's Jedi will be making its debut sooner than previously planned. <laughs> and NASA's Robonaut 2 is back on Earth for repairs. And later we have Jared interviewing Tim Ellis, CEO of Relativity Space. And then, of course, we look at your questions and comments from last week's show. This is Tomorrow Orbit 11.19. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Now, before we get into our news, we want to give a huge thank you to our Escape Velocity citizens. These people give us $10 per episode or $30 a month. And in return, they get their name in all three segments of the show, exclusive access to our Escape Velocity Discord channel, and so much more. Every bit helps, and we would not be able to continue making these awesome shows if it weren't for you. So for a complete list of rewards, or if you would like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com.tmro. Now, I am really excited to get into the launches for this week. The first one, Mike, it's a long march for C. Let you tell, tell about it. <laughs> That's right. So uh, China launched a uh, civilian-operated Earth observation satellite named Gaofan 5, and uh, that launched on Tuesday to check out uh, air pollutants and uh, different things with the ocean and just be able to have their first hyperspectral imager. So let's check out the footage of that. The Galfin 5 environmental monitoring satellite launched at 1828 Coordinated Universal Time on Tuesday, May 8th, aboard a Long March 4C rocket from the Tiyuan Space Center in northern China. Uh, with a planned eight-year mission, Galfin 5 is the next in line for the uh, Chinese Earth observation satellites uh, that are built for civilian op observations. And it carries, as I said, a hyperspectral Im imaging instrument that has uh, really uh, a sensitive instruments that can detect variations in land cover and water clarity and is going to be able to track air pollution as well. And Chinese scientists and engineers installed six instruments on Galfin 5 making it one of the country's most capable and versatile Earth observation satellites. The three-stage liquid-fueled Long March 4C rocket placed Galfin 5 into an orbit around 680 kilometers above Earth in a polar orbit, according to tracking data, which was published by the U.S. military. And Chinese space authorities declared the launch a success, making this the country's 14th space launch of the year. And that makes a pretty, uh, that's a record pace for uh, launch activity for China this year, averaging about one launch every nine days from their three different launch sites. So uh, pretty cool. And I'm also impressed to see uh, some better uh, visual graphics uh, in, in some of their launches there. And uh, from the control center, it looks like they finally upgraded to Windows 7. So happy yeah, to see great. the uh, better quality stuff there. <laughs> That's so great, and that's super important too, because it's going to be looking at um, atmospheric pollution and things like really important stuff that hopefully can start to move forward in um, fixing any type of climate change problems that we're experiencing here on Earth. So that's mm -hmm. that's awesome, very cool. And one of the cool things too about the uh, China's civilian operated programs like this is they do share that data worldwide. So uh, mm -hmm. you know all these military launches, we won't see any data from that, but we will see right. some data from this you know, for those who are interested in and who are are interested in collaborating as much data as possible to get the best and most up to date. Wow, that's great, program. and it'll just be online somewhere. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, uh, through the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So. Awesome. Very cool. So keep an eye out, everyone. 
Cool. And I believe there was another launch this week uh, for Bangladesh. Yes, there was. Yes. And I'm sure this is the one that everyone is uh, looking forward to uh, the most. And of course, we're talking about SpaceX debuting their Block 5 upgrade of the Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, it's a higher thrust uh, version of the Falcon 9 rocket, and it debuted yesterday on Friday after a brief uh, one-day turnaround from a uh, hold, from a, uh, a glitch from it. But in any case, let's check out the maiden flight of the Block 5 of Falcon 9. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition, liftoff. This launch occurred at 2014 Coordinated Universal's time. Uh, yesterday, as I said, Friday, May 11th, from the historic launch complex 39A in Cape Canaveral, Florida. I apologize there, my audio is cutting out a little bit. But as I said, this launch occurred at 2014 Coordinated Universal Time on May 11th. And uh, the launch try on Thursday ended at T minus one minute after computers on board the Falcon 9 detected an out of bounds parameter. And thankfully, no such glitches appeared on Friday's launch countdown. Now, this successful launch propelled SpaceX a little bit closer to launching astronauts for NASA as well, which will fly on the same Block 5 model of the Falcon 9 rocket. And just, oh, look at that footage. That's probably some of the most beautiful views I've seen of the first stage looking down at Earth. Uh, the payload for this mission was the Peng uh, uh, Bangabandhu 1 communication satellite for Bangladesh. And it's a French-built spacecraft, uh, uh, which is destined uh, to provide television and data relay services for the Bangladesh Telecommunication Regulatory Commission. Now, after separating from the rocket's upper stage two and a half minutes into the mission, uh, the booster pulsed thrusters spread by pressurized nitrogen gas to flip around and uh, then reignited later some of its engines to steer towards the re recovery ship, Of Course I Still Love You, in the uh, Atlantic. Slow down for a landing. Now, although video feed was uh, cut out for the landing itself, uh, we did get to see the aftermath of the landed first stage, uh, the first Block 5 to, to do so, to have a successful powered landing. And it's also the 25th recovered first stage overall from SpaceX. You'll see the, the footage that we did get for, uh, from, from that in just a moment here. And uh, as uh, the mission progressed, the Falcon 9 upper stage released uh, uh, Benga Bandu 1 into an orbit ranging between 300 kilometers to 35,706 kilometers in altitude tilted at an inclination of 19.3 degrees to the, uh, to the equator, making this a geostationary transfer orbit. And uh, Bangabandhu's one uh, onboard engine is going to circularize its orbit to a geostationary altitude within uh, the next 11 days. And in just a moment here, you'll be able to see the, uh, uh, the footage, the aftermath, just it, uh, appearing uh, of the landing there <laughs> of, of the first Block 5. So very awesome to see that. Um, now, the Block 5 first stage booster is designed to fly 10 times with no scheduled refurbishment. And Elon Musk said that uh, with moderate scheduled maintenance, Block 5 first stages could be capable of 100 missions. So this could finally prove out uh, um, the reusability goals and have hopefully cheaper and a more affordable uh, spaceflight missions with uh, the Falcon 9. So many improvements have been made to Block 5. And not only has, have they done all the different uh, human rating requirements, it also has a new inner stage, better construction materials, and removal of the locking mechanism on the landing legs itself. And instead, they have an internal locking mechanism so that it's easier to be able to um, uh, move the legs, especially uh, after they've recovered it. And it can just be moved with actuators instead of taking hours to move it back into place. So, And so much more. So many upgrades have been done on the Block 5 that we just don't have time to get into right now. But this was an awesome mission and some beautiful footage. Seems like it got some upgraded cameras or at least uh, yeah. uh, different <laughs> color settings on it or something. Just ah, beautiful footage from this mission. This was incredible. Yeah, I've seen quite a quite a few comments of you guys in the chat talking about the cameras. That really is is great footage. I love that, and um, the fact that too will be able to fly a ten times in a row without needing any any like adjustments or anything to it. That's incredible! Wow, oh man. Well, I'm super excited to see what's what's really going to come out of this. Um, 
for future launches uh, and see the lineup. So um, speaking of mm -hmm. other things that are going into space, <laughs> uh, something about <laughs> Jedi is going into space. Ah, Cosplay yes. cosmologist. Which is what just is that? perfect considering uh, May 4th was not too long ago. May the 4th yes. be with you all, even though it's technically the 12th. Um, but yeah, the force <laughs> mapping laser instrument Jedi is on its way to the ISS earlier than previously planned. Um, so previously sent to launch in mid-2019, this new space-bound gadget will now be joining the space station later this year. JEDI, which stands for Global Ecosystems Dynamics Investigation, is the first of its kind. Basically, its purpose is to map the Earth's forests in high-resolution 3D. Uh, and by doing this, what it's going to do is measure how much carbon is held in Earth's tropical and temperate forests. Uh, it's also going to track how much of the rising CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere um, will affect its ecosystems, as well as how much it can actually absorb and how much forest changes impact biodiversity. So according to Jedi principal investigator, investigator Ralph Dubaya, scientists have long awaited the opportunity to get comprehensive information about the structure of forests from space to deepen our understanding of how this structure impacts carbon resources and biodiversity across large regions and even globally. JEDI will accomplish this by using three different lasers that produce 10 parallel tracks of observation and a technology known as LIDAR, which you might have heard of. Um, it's technically called Light Detection and Ranging, LIDAR for short. Um, it's the technology used in self-driving cars, and basically what it is is a surveying method that emits pulses of infrared light to bounce off of surfaces and then measure exactly how much light is reflected back. During its two-year mission, JEDI will take 15 billion cloudless observations. All of this information that's received by JEDI's telescope is going to reveal details about the height and density of the trees and vegetation, and even the structure of leaves and branches within a forest canopy. According to the website, this data will then contribute to weather forecasting, forest management, glacier and snowpack monitoring, and of course, the generation of more accurate digital elevation models. This mission comes at a particularly important time given the current administration's recent cuts to a lot of Earth science and climate missions funding. So the fact that it's getting pushed to um, go out even earlier is really quite spectacular. Um, JEDI is going to be boarding SpaceX's 16th Commercial Resupply Services mission later this year. And all I got to say is <laughs> we wish you a successful voyage and may the forest be with you. I wish I was clever enough to say that I thought of that, but that's all NASA. And I'll be honest, I was trying to think of clever things to say, oh, Jedi, Star Wars is great. But then I go on NASA and they're way ahead of me because they're amazing and hilarious. And they've already got that like they've beautiful screen that was up there. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But wow, 15 billion cloudless yeah. images. And it's going to be just absolutely, um, I mean, unprecedented really when it comes to the detail and all of the data we're going to get from that. Yeah. And it's really important, again, as they mentioned, as CO2 levels rise, how that's mm -hmm. impacting overall forest. Forestry. And as we yeah. know, um, the forests on our planet aren't exactly, you know, having the best time right now. So yeah, learning, yeah, the more we can learn, the better. For sure. That's amazing. I've even seen some fun comments in the chat. This one's from J. Michael Entowitz. Uh, yes, rising CO2, plant food plants are getting jiggy with it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought that was just uh, pretty funny. But yeah, there's, there's rising CO2 levels. So I like that there's technology like this um, being implemented to actually try and um, yeah, figure out what exactly we can do as far as our forests and help mm -hmm. restore that. Uh, well, that's really cool. So that's going to space. And then as far as what's coming back from space, Mike, something yeah. about a Robonaut? What? Yeah, yeah. we're going to talk about Robonaut 2. You guys remember Robonaut 2? Robonaut 2 was so cool. It was supposed to be so awesome, <laughs> yep. and it just kind of quietly you know, wasn't really talked about a whole lot. Well, Robonaut 2 has had quite a bit of drama. It was launched to the space station in February of 2011, and it, was, it wasn't the first robot to be spent, sent to the space station, but it was the first humanoid robot that was designed to be able to help the astronauts with a whole bunch of mundane tasks Aww. that they could, the robot could be doing while the astronauts are, are doing doing other research or other scientific experiments nice. and utilizing their time better. So uh, during the seven years in space, um, they had a bunch of technical problems with Robonaut 2, and it's now back on Earth to repair its problems that couldn't be fixed at the space station. Originally, Robonaut 2's purpose would, uh, as I said, have been to do with a, a lot of the dull and repetitive tasks that take up a significant amount of time that uh, the, the crew at the station could be doing on other important tasks. Now, eventually, 
um, R2 would have been upgraded with advanced robotic legs and grips so that it could perform complex tasks not only inside the space station, but outside the space station as well. And for a while, things went really well, and uh, the robot was unboxed from its uh, protective foam packaging and uh, set up in the Dest Destiny Laboratory module at the International Space Station. It was powered up for the first time. There's those, uh, those legs that I was talking about right there and the grips that were on them that would be able to, to grab the different handholds inside the space station and outside the space station as well. There's an example of one of the, uh, the, the handholds that are outside the space station. Anyway, um, when Robonaut 2, which I'm just going to call R2 from here on, kind of keeping with the ISS and uh, Star Wars theme here. <laughs> um, uh, when it was sent up to the space station, it was powered up for the first time in August of 2011. And by 2012, it was uh, flipping practice switches and doing some cleaning practice on the handrails uh, while being teleoperated from the ground. Once a month or so, astronauts uh, would set Robonaut up and uh, it would do research tasks for several hours at a time, working towards making a transition from an experimental project into an actual useful helper in the caretaking of the space station and human spacecraft in general. That's, that's the whole purpose of this is how could this be used for more things in the future, not just at the space station. However, um, but... <sighs> In 2014, NASA decided to, to go forward with the uh, complex and risky upgrade, which turned oh out, God. of adding oh, those robotic legs. And R2 uh, was sent up at first with just the, the head, torso, and arms. The upgrade didn't go according to plan, and instead <laughs> really? it created a really persistent problem that astronauts weren't able to fix. For the last several years, Robonaut has been almost entirely disabled, and publicly available ISS status reports show that the last time that R2 uh, completed a full research task was December of 2013. Wow. So NASA originally intended for there to be three distinct phases of its operations. The first phase involved the stationary operations, and that was basically completed successfully by the end of 2013 using the, just the upper torso. Phase two was the IVA mobility, where the IVA, of course, stands for intervehicular activity inside the space station. For this phase, uh, for this phase excuse me, um, there was going to be, uh, a, as I said, moving around the inside using the different handholds. And for phase three, that would be the EVA mobility working outside the space station. Adding the new robot legs, though, to uh, R2 was a lot more complex than simply shipping them up to the space station and bolting them to the torso. The leg installation would require upgrading a significant amount of R2's core hardware, including new computers and new wiring to interface the legs to the robot's main processor, and not to mention just the complex mechanical assembly process. And further complicating things was the fact that R2 was originally developed as a research robot on Earth and was not designed at all to be serviceable by astronauts. So to make a long story short, despite the astronauts' best efforts, they were not able to successfully install the legs, and NASA finally decided to ship R2 back to Earth on the most recent uh, Dragon cargo vessel, which returned to Earth on Saturday, May 5th. The hope is that R2 will be able to be repaired, they'll be able to do that successful installation of the legs, or one of its five spares could be sent back to the International Space Station instead to complete the original goal of R2 as a humanoid robotic assistant and not just a multi-million dollar button pusher. So. <laughs> Well, I really hope that it actually does go back. Um, I think that can be extremely useful, like you were saying. You know, the astronauts have so many other things they should be worrying about doing, where there's the, the more mundane tasks that really can be, you know, done actually by the robonaut. Um, and I'm sure, I kind of know the answer to this question, but um, Jump on Scales in the chat asks, uh, would the robot be controlled by the crew or on or Earth? And a few people did say probably ground control, but I'm just wondering if you knew the answer to that. Uh, as far as I know, they do all the um, here on the ground. They do uh, everything uh, here on the ground. But I believe that there is a capability to control it at the space station as well. Um, some of the stories, like uh, Tim Copra, for example, um, over the past couple of years, even though they'd already you know figured out that okay, this isn't working, the the installation of the legs here, he would spend some of his free time working on it and he would you know he was taking it apart piece by piece and trying to reassemble things powering it up and using the controls that he had instead of you know uh, having to 
not bother since this was something that he was doing in his free time, but but he didn't want to to have to to bring up the resources from the ground control to just to do his test to see if his adjustment had worked or not. So, uh. but I mean, even all that tinkering that he did and several other astronauts did didn't. Uh, you know, it, it didn't amount to to it being fixed, even though they video recorded everything. I mean, this was a very detailed process, and I mm-hmm. had no idea how how far the problems actually went for this because we weren't hearing anything about it. I almost forgot about R two. It's so cool looking. Yeah. I mean, it looks like <laughs> right? Boba Fett. Looks like Boba Fett. It's called R two, and <laughs> the, the thing that was supposed to be the coolest about it for me, in my opinion, was it to be able to do EVAs outside the space station. Yep. Mm-hmm. How exactly. many EVAs are there? Where all they're doing is just like installing some new cables or uh, readjusting the camera or you know something that's you know it's cool but it's kind of mundane you know mm-hmm. and those type of EVAs could be done by Robonaut so yeah exactly I hope that they stick with it and <laughs> fix it and try again I really hope they do yeah so I guess uh, until um, next time that he'll actually be going up we should find out where exactly Robonaut is hanging out and, and chilling we can hang out with him but sp- speaking of chilling there's something <laughs> happening with the sun right now and the sun is chilling apparently you Jade. on fire my gosh <laughs> it's hot <laughs> wow okay um, yeah as Athena said our sun is actually approaching the minimum of its solar cycle 24 but it's approaching it a little faster than we expected you see the sun goes through regular cycles each one lasting about 11 years or so and uh, basically it goes from a maximum to a minimum now a solar minimum is characterized by decreased solar activity, which means lower instances of sunspots, solar flares, and you know, other magnetic disturbances. Um, however, according to NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center, known as SWPC, the minimum is approaching sooner than we thought. Uh, scientists became weary of this due to observing an extremely low number of sunspots since April. Fewer than the expected, you know, approximate 15 we would think to see around this time. Solar activity has also just been very mild in general this year, having been 60% blank since early January. Um, And scientists say, you know, this could mean the minimum is lasting longer or solar cycle 25 is coming sooner. Now, this is consistent with the relatively weak maximum peak in 2014, which was the lowest since solar cycle 14 in 1906, so already some records were getting broken here. Now, this, paired with the unusually deep minimum in 2008, leads scientists to believe that the sun could just be entering an extended period of quietness. Now, there's still a lot to be learned. Um, Scientists are still not even completely sure what causes the cycles or what makes some cycles more intense or relaxed than the others. But does a sleepy sun really affect our day to day? Mm, Not really. However, decreased UV radiation means our upper atmosphere is going to cool and slightly contract, which is going to make it easier for space debris to collect into low Earth orbit. So we may be experiencing a somewhat junky atmosphere. Um, But more importantly, actually, a weakening magnetic field from the sun means less protection from cosmic rays. And this can impact Earth's weather by altering the upper atmosphere and also um, can provide condensation nuclei in the form of ions, which will see which would seed clouds. So we could be seeing some more cloudy weather and some more storms if that is the case. Um, And of course, we all know that it can also cause potential harm to astronauts as well if those cosmic rays are also kind of pummeling us and the sun isn't really doing much to protect us. Um, So yeah, sun is, uh, looks like it's going not quite into hibernation mode. Obviously we would be toast or done, but uh, definitely a little more chilled out than usual. Huh, interesting. There's actually a question here in the chat from Andrew uh, Shire. They say, is this not a good thing? I mean, for me, if there's going to be more cloudy weather, I wouldn't, that wouldn't be a good thing for me, but as Um, far as... No, well... The thing is, is that um, space weather, so cosmic rays, they can impact, you know, like different um, different satellites orbiting mm-hmm. in, you know, the atmosphere. However, um, in terms of the sun's overall activity, now, unless it's like, obviously, we know the damage that could be done by really intense flares and really intense um, magnetic disturbances, but the sun getting quieter doesn't necessarily have too much of a direct effect here on the surface. Mm-hmm. It's more so... Um, whether you're an astronaut on ISS or, you know, uh, things that are kind of going on more so in the upper echelons of our atmosphere. But I think we'll be okay. Okay. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it's more begging the question whether or not, you know, the solar maximum is going to happen sooner than we thought since since the minimum is coming coming sooner. So Exactly. Mm -hmm. We'll see. 
And I also did see a question uh, by Sir Gamelot. It said, didn't we put some probes near the sun? <laughs> Maybe he's feeling flattered. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, yeah, I wanted to, there is going you know, to be a launch of the Parker Solar Probe um, from NASA. That will be coming up soon. So uh, there is going to be some more research being done on the sun. So that's really exciting. But um, also, cool. Well, that about wraps up our news. We're going to head to a quick calendar <laughs> break. And then Jared is going to be interviewing Tim Ellis. And uh, it's going to be a really exciting interview. So stay tuned. There's more tomorrow coming up. And welcome <clears throat> back to tomorrow. Now, before we get into our interview today, which you are going to be fascinated by this interview today, we got to thank our Escape Velocity citizens. These folks give us $10 or more per episode on Patreon, and they get a whole lot of stuff. But we also have our Orbital citizens as well. These folks give us $5 an episode or more on Patreon, and they get so much stuff. They get their name in the show during the second and third segment. I'm only getting my name in the show once today, so you get your name in the show more than I do. Also, you get exclusive access to our citizen-only hangouts, early access to After Dark. You get to see the rundowns. So you can see the jokes that we put in trying to make each other laugh on the show. Free worldwide swag shipping. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff. And if you want to know about some of the stuff that you can do, or just help crowd fund the shows of tomorrow, you can head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. And I'm very excited today because I really like rockets and I really like talking about rockets and I really like talking about rockets with people who work on rockets. And we've got Tim Ellis today. You are the co-founder and CEO of Relativity Space and we are so excited to have you on the show today. Yeah, I'm excited as well. So looking forward to talking rockets. Excellent. Yeah, so to, to talk a little bit about rockets, we're going to kind of go back a little bit. Um, so just Tell us a little bit about yourself, like for our Tomorrow viewers, so they can kind of get to know you a little bit. Uh, yeah, sure. So my background previously, uh, well, I guess it started way back at, at USC um, in college, where uh, I met my co-founder, Jordan, um, and we were both leading up a group called the USC Rocket Propulsion Lab. So I was actually working to be the first student group in the world to launch a rocket past 100 kilometers. Um, I was actually going to go to about like 130, 140. Um, and it was like all built like by students and designed, um, you know, partially by me and, and Jordan. But there's a group of like 60 or 70 students um, back back then. Uh, and you know, we did the first attempts. It was kind of like a zero to Mach seven like sounding rocket um, out at a uh, Black Rock Lake. Um, and so that that like got us the first experience into rockets. But then I actually went to Blue Origin, um, interned there three times back to back. Um, and then ended up actually working on a little bit of uh, BE3, but mostly BE4, um, and then the RCS thrusters for the, the human crew capsule. I did uh, some of the design for like a thruster that um, I, I believe is yet to fly, but you know we got it all the way through development and uh, ended up starting the metal 3D printing uh, group at, at Blue as well and brought metal printing in-house. So that's, that's kind of how we got into metal 3D printing. Um, you know, at Blue Origin, and then at Relativity, we're really looking to take that, like, 
pretty much to its logical conclusion where like we think you know an entire rocket could actually be 3D printed like and, structure and all. Yeah. And if I recall correctly Jordan was involved at SpaceX? Yeah so Jordan worked on the uh, high pressure helium system for Crew Dragon uh, Super Draco um, so he was an RV for some of the like valve components which yeah when you're dealing with super high pressure helium and it's got to stay in space for a long time that's like really really hard so I've, I've known Jordan now for like eight years. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I definitely got to uh, ask you guys about this um, because you're at Blue Origin and yeah. Jordan's at SpaceX. Yeah. Um, and we're kind of getting towards the end of 2015 with everything. Mm -hmm. And you guys get together and you sort of have an idea, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, we have a pretty big idea. I mean, so be because uh, Jordan was working in the Super Draco group, like uh, I had done a lot of metal 3D printing at Blue, like had designed, you know, I got lucky that I got to work on like turbo pumps and combustion devices both, um, which was quite cool. Uh, and, and a little bit on New Glenn on some systems work as well. And, and it just kind of seemed like uh, three, like metal 3D printing was the inevitable future for like how um, not just like all rockets would be built on Earth, but like how we think things will actually be built on other planets. Um, and so we had this kind of crazy idea of like, well, why are companies printing, you know, just one part here and there for like a rocket, like, and, you know, parts of engines and things like that. Like, why don't we just take, you know, what is normally about 100,000 individual parts and like consolidate all of those and like print kind of almost everything. Um, except for electronics and like some like turbo pump bearings and mm -hmm. stuff, but uh, otherwise we're printing like 95% of, of a rocket, um, and we have this long-term goal of also being the first company to 3D print a rocket on Mars. Um, so we actually want to help, like, and have been very inspired by all the progress SpaceX has made for the last 15 years, um, but have maybe thought, you know, why why is there not like a second company that their core mission is to help humanity be multiplanetary, but they're working on a different part of the problem. So for us, um, we're really working on like, okay, we're going to launch people there. Um, and, you know, SpaceX is working on that. NASA's working on that. Um, you know, Blue Origins, of course, building like New Glenn, which is their own huge rocket. <laughs> and they have like really ambitious plans for that too. Um, but as these new kind of capabilities, you know, come into the picture, like we, we really think there needs to be a, a second company or really like dozens to hundreds more um, to make uh, colonization like really happen even faster um, and, and, you know, even on a bigger scale than what I think even those companies can do. So, you know, you really, we really kind of started to look at the parameters for, okay, how are you actually going to make something on another planet? Like, what, what does that factory look like? Um, and so we, we kind of saw initially you wouldn't have very many people. Um, and, and so you need a manufacturing method that, like, uses kind of limited labor and, like, has a very small footprint and is very lightweight. Um, and you can actually you know, launch to another planet pretty cost effectively and can make a very wide range of, of parts. Um, and that just happens to be a 3D printer. Um, and it turns out then like creating this tech to fully 3D print rockets like on Earth, which we think is going to totally um, change the, the game as far as how quickly you can make rockets and how quick you can iterate designs. Um, and really get away from like a lot of fixed tooling and, and factories that just isn't very flexible, um, that that uh, target is actually totally on path to this long-term goal. Um, and so it's great. We get to have like a lucrative business case like early on um, that lets us scale and be like a really big company and, and uh, also help a lot with launching satellites, you know, and not, not that long from now. Um, but then there actually is a long-term vision too, which is, you know, we're hoping to inspire way more companies to actually help out. Yeah, I love that. Uh, you guys came from SpaceX and Blue Origin and you're basically like not innovative enough and you go off and start <laughs> your own, yeah. own company yeah. to make it, that happen, which is, yeah. which is like, that's a great way of going about it. You know, you get in, you get that experience with those two, uh, those two big companies that are kind of pushing the things. And then you kind of, you kind of get the idea of how can we push it even further? And then you go off and you actually make it happen. So, yeah, um, yeah. and that's, that is such a really cool way to do it. Um, so what is, what is the core of relativity space? Is it, or presently, what is the core yeah, of relativity sure. space? Cause you want to do a lot of colonization work later yeah. on. Um, but, but we're, we're at the point where we're only chucking like one ton rovers to Mars right, um, at right, the right. moment. Yeah, um, right. So, so what are you guys doing currently as relativity space? Yeah, sure. So relativity is building our own launch vehicle. Um, and we're really working to automate, 
uh, as much of the production as possible. So we actually really just view 3D printing as a way to, to automate production. Um, you know, one, one good example, so we've done, uh, you know, the video we just showed before this, um, we've done over 100 uh, engine like chamber firings at Stennis Space Center to date. Uh, and that's all like entirely 3D printed. So normally, you know, that, that like injector type we're using and the chamber and, and everything else um, there would normally be like hundreds to even upwards of, you know, 1,500 or so parts just for that part of the, the engine. And uh, we're able to print that in just three components. So in a lot of ways, we just view that as, as automation where you're assembling these kind of normally separate parts together, but in, um, yeah, in a 3D printer. And so we're building our own launch service. Uh, it's like a 1,250 kilogram launch vehicle. So it's actually on the definite bigger side of things um, relative to a lot of the, the kind of other startup companies doing CubeSat launchers and things like that. So um, yeah, we're really looking to launch like low Earth orbit satellite constellations um, and can definitely do some pretty big stuff. And uh, Prismara from our chat room is actually asking, wait, so how many different pieces go into that engine? And that's your Aeon 1 engine, yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah, so it's so the igniter like injector combustion chamber and nozzle, that's only three parts um, that we've been testing so far. Um so that's been in like kind of a like full power, like flight weight, um, pressure fed configuration. And then we're working on turbo pumps and valves and like TVC next. Um, and so the, the total engine part count will be under 100 parts. Under 100 parts? Yeah, yeah under 100 parts. <laughs> and, and it's like, and it's like uh, yeah, like open expander cycle. That is like amazing. Very high performance. There's engine. more parts in the engine on my Jeep than yeah, there will yeah. be in this rocket engine. Yeah, That's yeah. just. And, and you can build it very fast. Um, so also the production time. Um, that, that we'll be able to get to is, is under about uh, 15 days. 15 days to build yeah. an engine. Yeah, exactly. Under 100 parts. That yeah. is ridiculously yeah. Yeah. amazing. Yeah, totally. And there's no sacrifice <laughs> in performance. Um, so that's what's, what's pretty cool, too, because, yeah, normally you get um, th things like pressure-fed engines. I mean, they, they actually have very few parts, too, mm -hmm. um, but they don't necessarily scale to, to like, larger payload sizes or, or things like that. Um, and so this engine architecture we've built, and, and really the whole rocket, is designed around scalability. Like since we now have this new manufacturing method that doesn't have fixed tooling, like we can actually change the diameter of our rocket without reconfiguring the factory at all. Um, mm -hmm. And so we wanted to also have an engine architecture and avionics and other parts of the system that could be just as flexible. Um, so that way we can just iterate faster and kind of see, uh, see what we think is like the best future designs happen quicker. Gotcha, and uh, if I heard correctly, you actually have the largest metal 3D printer in the world. Yeah, right yeah, it's now. like Westworld for uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like Westworld for rockets, like. Um, and you call it Stargate. Stargate, which is named after. Uh, do you play Starcraft at all? Uh, yeah, yeah, you, I yeah. did back in the day. Back so. in the day, yeah. Me too. I don't. I don't have time anymore. But yeah, so it's uh, we have a huge like Protoss logo up on the star on the Stargate. Um, yeah, great. and it's there funny. it is. By the way, that is just <laughs> yeah. amazing looking. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's super funny because we had there was actually um, so this is the third version of the printer we've actually built um, so we actually had two kind of prototypes we just haven't publicly showed um, before this one so this one's actually sized that we could uh, with with like the scale it's at and the print rates and kind of the technology in it actually go print like uh, orbital like rocket structures like with this this one um, so our whole rockets you know 100 feet tall and like seven foot diameter and so we can actually build that in this in this printer just in sections and then you kind of join them together and uh, don't jump on scales from our chat room is asking what type of metals are used in the 3D printing? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's really, uh, we, we early on wanted, you know, one of the benefits of 3D printing is just to simplify the supply chain. So we actually are building out of fewer metals and just like using kind of the strongest thing of available for, for each application. So the engine is like a, uh, like a nickel based alloy. So it's not Inconel, it's actually like, a different one that's a little bit less commonly used, um, but is actually much higher strength, like at high temperature. Um, so that was really good for the engine. Um, and then all the valves and kind of other parts are made out of that same material. And then what's really cool is for Stargate, um, that's all like an aluminum alloy that we're actually developing ourselves. Um, so we actually made like our own material, um, which is built around the printing process. And it's just like super, super high strength um, and designed for like 
very fast heating and cooling rates that you see while printing. Very cool. And Sergeant Enzyme uh, wants to know, uh, how much weight do you save 3D printing the whole rocket? Do you guys save any weight? Um, yeah, I mean, so we, we definitely will, I would say, more even over time. I mean, so that's, that's one of the cool things about 3D printing is it actually incentivizes you to make things as lightweight as possible because since you're building up material from scratch, it's actually both faster and cheaper to uh, make it as light as possible. Um, versus with you know things like machining, it actually is more expensive and takes more time to sculpt it away into like the most optimized kind of thing you can. Um, but with three D printing, like like yeah, well, that, that's kind of why we have this belief. You know, we we like, can't see a future where rockets are not three D printed, um, just specifically because the lighter you make it, it's actually cheaper and faster. And Hanny's Vorwerp in our Twitch chat is wondering about how do you ensure the integrity of the parts you make using the 3D printing technique? Yeah, sure. Um, so, no, de definitely that's like a question we get a lot. And it's kind of funny to me because, uh, yeah, like, like a lot of the 3D printing is actually pretty mature as far as the processes to inspect uh, stuff now. So a lot of times you'll print like tensile kind of coupons and do like scanning electron like microscopy to just like validate like the materials are good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you do, uh, you know, there's like a normal qualification process um, where you're doing hydro proof testing which is basically just making sure it can actually hold the loads you expected. Um, and then you do things like CT scanning, where you actually are taking an x-ray of the entire component, like in 3D, and mm -hmm. then you can uh, slice it and kind of understand you know, where cracks or pores like are, um, and then making sure that that meets the specification for like crack uh, and pore size. Yeah, yeah. and uh, YPay1 on YouTube uh, is asking, where do you get the resources and space for 3D printing? And then in our chat room too, uh, Jazz Throwout is asking, do you work on in situ resource utilization methods to close that gap? Um, so I guess sort of you want to 3D yeah. print the first rocket on Mars. Yeah. Are you going to use Mars to actually do that itself? Uh, yeah, I mean, eventually that's like the reason why you would want to do this, um, because then it's really like every flight there um, that you're bringing electronics and bearings and kind of the challenging to manufacture components on Mars. Uh, you can augment that, you know, like every flight there may be like 20 flights back um, to where you're actually making the propellants and the kind of very heavy like main structures and engine parts on Mars with 3D printers. Um, probably what's really cool is because we're not necessarily flying people, um, there's a little bit of a lower barrier to entry to just say, all right, we're going to send like a really small 3D printer to Mars first and like bring the material along with it. Um, and, and like trial it kind of in that environment, you know, at a smaller scale first and kind of just iterate like bigger and bigger um, from there. Cool. Um, Epic Future Space on YouTube is uh, asking, is your ultimate goal to have manufacturing in space as well? So are you guys looking at uh, just beyond Earth and Mars and in space as well? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I would I would not necessarily rule it out now. I would just say that Mars is, is definitely the end goal. Um, and, and again, with just kind of the, the point that uh, we just really need multiple companies like working on that same goal, um, because I think, yeah, it'll just happen so much faster to have multiple companies on that. All right, and uh, everybody is uh, really on it about uh, about 3D printing, um, because I mean, it's really cool yeah. to hear that we're 3D printing 95% of our rocket. Um, and Hanny Zwerber has another great question from our Twitch chat, uh, which is asking what technology was needed to get the 3D printing to work at space specifications? Because I know, yeah. um, you know, tolerances on rockets yeah. and spacecraft are like razor thin yeah, and yeah. actually th sometimes thinner than the blade of a razor, um, yeah, literally. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So what, what were some of the things that you had to overcome in order to make that happen? Yeah, totally. Um, so, I mean, definitely one is having really strong materials that are actually designed like for 3D printing. Um, I mean, it just, it, like, yeah, really 3D printing is like a very fundamentally different way of doing manufacturing. Um, like you're saying, and, and really also designing the parts for 3D printing from the beginning is important because when you're able to actually like assemble the parts and kind of stitch them together in the 3D printer, um, then your tolerances are actually much less because you're, you're already kind of assembling them like in the printer and the reason tolerances can be quite high um, is just assembling, you know, 
dozens of parts together and all those tolerances actually add up um, so that they have to be super, super tight for like kind of this whole assembly to work. Um, but if you design it for, for um, 3D printing from the start and you're, you're still doing like machining and things like that um, just to get the finished like tolerances and some surfaces. Um, but yeah, it's just it, it, basically if you think about it, it actually becomes less of a problem if you do it from the beginning. Yeah. And uh, Sir Game A Lot from our chat room is asking about specifically 3D printing. Why fast? Because typically 3D printing is very slow. Because um, yeah. you said you could print an engine in 15 days. Yeah, right. So right. Why, why so fast with the with the 3D printing? Yeah, sure. Uh, and so engines 15 days. The entire rocket um, we're we're targeting going from raw material to flying in 60 days. Um, so we actually like believe like literally going from like <laughs> nothing to actually flying in 60 days. I could like call you possible. up. Hey, I need a rocket. Yeah. And like two months from now. Yeah, it's we like on the start, pad. I've got it integrated and we're ready to fly. Yeah, and we like so. start building it at the beginning. Of gotcha. That. Um, yeah, we, and then 60 days later, it could actually be a different design too, which is also what's uh, pretty cool. So you can you can like actually like change the design specific for what a customer wants. Uh, yeah, pot potentially. Um, there's there's some questions there as far as like how we'd actually qualify like you know different diameters like every single flight or different like uh, kind of aero like trajectory profiles but um, yeah certainly things like fairing dimensions uh, that that's something customers are you know pretty interested in like can we actually make bigger fairings smaller fairings um, you know can we do like kind of integral stiffeners for like a payload ring where we can kind of notch out different like you know, there's like coupled loads, you know, between the satellites and the rocket where there's a lot of vibration. Um, and besides dampeners, which you normally kind of tune to, to like null those out, um, we could actually add like isogrid inside the tanks to like stiffen certain parts and, and make like the kind of payload rocket integration like work a lot more streamlined too. Yeah, and those are usually things that are like single serving for everybody when you fly yeah. a rocket, you know. Right. This is the payload fairing that we use as a company, yeah. you know, uh, that's what we're putting in it. Uh, yeah. Like a great example uh, is is comparing like a, a, a geostationary commsat um, to TESS that was just flown a couple weeks ago on a on a SpaceX Falcon Nine, yeah. where these geostationary sats are like these huge monolithic monsters inside of the <laughs> fairing, and then TESS was like this little itty bitty thing yeah. Um, yeah, inside yeah, yeah, of it. Yeah. So, yeah. so you guys could actually like change the fairing to be smaller, which ends up like lowering weight, which increases performance potentially, things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, and it's also too, I mean, we're, like, like we haven't launched yet, even though we've done, you know, these like 100 engine tests, and um, yeah, I'd love to, we can talk about like even the engine test site that we got at NASA Stennis Space Center, because um, it's it's like huge, and, and yeah, we're, we're like making very solid progress towards launching, but we're actually able to have conversations with customers now where, um, you know, you know, we weren't always actually at a, a like 1,250 kilogram payload size. Like we actually started the company and we're kind of a smaller payload size, but we got to that point after just talking to customers and really seeing where the interest was. Uh, and we realized, because there were lots of conversations where we'd go into, you know, a talk with someone and they'd say, oh, hey, like, we'd love to launch you. Your price is like super competitive and you can make rockets super quickly. This is awesome. But our satellites, you know, 100 kilograms bigger than what your rocket can actually do. And so we are actually able to keep doing developments and, and like just bump up like our vehicle size without really like redoing a bunch of development versus if we had already kind of ordered a friction stir welder, like started spin forming domes, like it would have been pretty challenging at that point to like really adapt to what uh, new customer demands were. Um, and we've also really seen satellites just get bigger and bigger over time. Um, like uh, there's a lot of talk about CubeSats and kind of these you know constellations of tons and tons of like 3U CubeSats. Um, you know now we're seeing a more 6U, like 12U, like 50 kilogram, 100, 150, and, and it just is keeping on going up. And now we're seeing tons of uh, you know, development in the, the, the kind of like 500 kilogram to like 900 kilogram payload class. Um, and we just expect that to keep going up um, over time just because like dollar per bit and like telescope kind of optics efficiency <laughs> gets better like the bigger it is. Yeah. And so as long as launch costs like keep going down, um, I, I think satellites will probably tend to get bigger. And is that what's going to separate you from a lot of the other small sat, uh, small sat launcher companies that are on, that are sort of brewing right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, de definitely the ability to like kind of iterate and, and change to adaptable market conditions like as quickly as possible, I think is extremely important. Um, but we're also able to do that at the same time as uh, reducing labor and kind of 
get into like the Westworld for rockets future where like, you know, you kind of just put raw material in and a bunch of uh, industrial robots are like printing it, assembling it, doing all the testing and checkouts um, and then out rolls, you know, a rocket and, and you go launch it. Yeah. And speaking of your rocket, tell us about it. It's yeah, called sure. Terran 1. Yeah. Uh, Terran 1, also named after StarCraft. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I promise I only played a lot <laughs> way, way back in the day. Hey, I played, but, uh, I probably, I'm yeah. right there with you. I probably yeah. played too much. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, so it's called Terran 1, um, so it's it's got nine engines on the first stage, uh, one on the upper stage, um, so all Aeon 1 engines, um, really the only difference is on the upper stage it has, you know, a huge, like, vacuum nozzle, um, mm -hmm. that's kind of, yeah. like, you gotta have that's that. That's how physics works. It's so. how physics works, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so it's nine on the first stage, one on the upper stage, so it's a... Um, uh, 20,000 vacuum thrust engine, 20,000 pound thrust, um, which is actually, yeah, it's getting to be like quite, quite on the larger scale um, and locks methane, uh, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. So we actually um, did that because the architecture we're using for the rocket gets a lot simpler with having mm -hmm. two cryogenic propellants. Yeah. Um, and so we're doing what's called an open expander cycle uh, for the turbo pumps, which really has only been done like a lot by the Japanese. Uh, and so we don't have like a separate gas generator or like other kind of combustion devices like in full flow stage combustion or stage combustion. Um, and so what we're really doing then is the uh, methane is kind of cooling the chamber in like uh, region cooling channels. And then it actually uh, picks up enough heat to go super critical like in the air turn into a gas. Um, in, in the cooling channels, and then you tap off some of that gas to run the turbines for the turbo pumps. Um, and then we're al also tapping that gas off to do what's called autogenous pressurization for the tank. So that's, autogenous just means like it does itself. So mm -hmm. like the, uh, the uh, methane and a little bit of the LOX actually gasifies and pressurizes the tanks. Uh, so we don't have helium pressure bottles or COPVs at all either. Okay, yeah, because COPVs are like They're a pain. Um, composite overwrap pressure vessels, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, For yeah. our viewers who don't know um, what that is, uh, basically you don't want to know what that is. Um, <laughs> because, oh my gosh, they're immensely difficult uh, to work with. Yeah. Um, and some really cool news that you guys just announced, which is that you recently, you just picked up a 20-year lease for an yeah. engine test stand at NASA Stennis? Yeah, and actually it's for a whole vehicle. Um, oh, okay. So we're able to do, yeah, so we can actually, it, so, yeah, it, it's, the agreement was uh, Stennis's first uh, CSLA. It's like a commercial space launch act agreement. Um, and so what that is is really like a very hands-off agreement where we get to use this test site for the next uh, 20 years, like exclusive use, um, which is a super sweet deal yeah. uh, because it already has a lot of existing infrastructure. Um, and it was originally de developed for like 500,000 pound thrust engines. Um, and so it has these huge, like 32 foot tall, like, you know, three foot thick, like concrete blast cell, like everything's like blast hardened for like 500,000 <laughs> pound thrust engines. Um, and it has four of these cells that we can actually build, um, like, like we're going to do, you know, at first, like a, a second stage hold down test stand where we can test like engines plus like integrate them with an actual full scale second stage and do like a full kind of, you know, six to seven minute, like full mission firing. Um, but then we can also build like a first stage hold down test stand and like two other engine test stands. Um, and so it's like a 25 acre site uh, of as far as what's existing, but we actually have the option to expand up to 250 acres as well. Um, so this is like our McGregor, or like our WTLS or our Mojave nice. uh, as far as permanent presence. Um, so we're super excited to partner with NASA on that. That is so cool. Um, just to go back to the chat room a little bit to kind of pull some things yeah, that uh, sure. folks are talking about. Uh, Travis Neal from YouTube has a really interesting question, um, which I was going to ask, but hey, you, got, you came up with it, Travis, <laughs> um, which is, do you consider yourself a 3D printer company or a launch provider? Yeah, so definitely a launch provider. Mm -hmm. um, really, we just view... Yeah, like the 3D printing is a core part of the technology we're developing and, and it really fits in with our long-term vision of, of like printing rockets on Mars and, and really the truth is we just need to develop both um, together because with 3D printed design, like the actual printer and the product you're making are, are like much more interlinked than like machining where, you know, the material's already kind of set and then you're just like machining and milling it together. Like with our printer, we have lots of sensors and uh, kind of quality control and like our own alloys, which were needed to develop to actually make like printing a whole rocket work. 
Um, and from our regular chat room, Strati is asking, have you looked at lunar basalt fiber as printing material? And I kind of want to expand that. Yeah. Um, with in situ printing, mm -hmm. what specifically are you looking at to, to do um, that, both like with Martian regolith and, and potentially lunar regolith, if you guys have looked at that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, the biggest, I, I will say we're actually very, um, right now, like very focused on developing just the core tech, like to actually make our first launcher uh, work. Um, but yeah, with, with other uh, you, you, like kind of planets, like you just look at the soil composition and we're making sure a lot of the materials we're using now um, could actually be made on other planets. Like there actually are, um, you know, to the best of our knowledge, kind of enough of the, the raw elements um, on, on like Mars and uh, potentially the moon uh, to actually make things uh, there. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Destructor1701 also has a really cool question as well, uh, which is, do you have plans to use your printer tech for other technologies, um, like maybe building a high-pressure gas system for the Mars colony and, and other things beyond that? Sure, yeah, so again, um, definitely if you can 3D print rockets and automate the production of rockets, you could, you could probably do that for other things. Um, I think, you know, our, our belief is actually launching satellites in this new kind of wave of, of like low Earth orbit, you know, internet and Earth imaging, um, and even, you know, potentially sending payloads for other customers like to like the moon mm -hmm. or Mars. Um, that's actually like the most lucrative initial thing to do. Um, and also kind of why rockets, like I can, I can talk a little bit about that too, besides our background. Um, again, since the lighter weight something is, the faster it prints and the mm -hmm. cheaper it thus is. Um, if you kind of think of like a rocket that maybe weighs 4,000 pounds, um, you know, empty with no propellant, and then like a car that weighs 4,000 pounds, actually the, the printed car and the printed rocket uh, cost like the same. Um, so it's really, I would think of it more like we're making, ro but then you can sell a rocket obviously for like mm -hmm. way more money. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, so we're kind of actually making like rockets really cheap. Um, and you kind of look at the hierarchy of like, like what is the lightest weight, you know, very, very large and like difficult to manufacture and expensive thing. Um, and that's usually the best thing to, to start with for 3D printing. So rockets are actually the top of that list anyway, regardless of our backgrounds at Blue and SpaceX and, and everything else. Um, but then, you know, next on the list would be other things that fly. Um, so whether it's like commercial aviation, drones, like, you know, military kind of stuff. I mean, that, that's it's a satellites uh, structures as well. So that's kind of the next on the list, yeah. And uh, Johnny Spacer has a very important question, which is, do the rockets come out all shiny? Um, because, you know, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. like, you can, you can build things all you want, but if it doesn't look cool... Yeah, I mean, it does certain, have you gotta to have a cool. cool factor with things. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you've seen, yeah the engine video before uh, before this, yeah, we we did um, polish that engine. Like it doesn't come out looking exactly <laughs> like that. Uh, but yeah, you got to make it cool um, because again, I mean, part of our mission is also like it, like it is making like real capability, and we have you know real customers we want to fly, and they don't necessarily all care what it looks like. Like they just want to get to orbit you know safely and for low cost. But as far as inspiring. Um, more companies to join uh, what what is happening in in the space industry and especially having like really big ambitious long-term visions then yeah making stuff look cool helps uh, inspire more people to do it absolutely and neuropilot in our chat room is also asking how big is it and um, I'm, I'm gonna break this up to ask both uh, size of rocket um, and size of your your 3d printer stargate as yeah, well sure sure uh, so like physically big you mean, sure or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's about, um, so Terran 1 is about 7 foot diameter, uh, 100 feet tall. Um, yeah, it can do 1250 kg to like low Earth orbits uh, and then 900 kilogram to like a sun synchronous mm -hmm. orbit at like 500 kilometers. And, and total cost? For 10, $10 million. Dollars. 10 million. Yeah, okay. 10 million. Yeah, so it ends up being, uh, and really we, we chose that because uh, if you look at, you know, kind of, other than SpaceX, which you know obviously is, is a very, very low cost um, provider, but they're a much larger launch vehicle. They're also launching their own satellite uh, constellation, uh, Starlink, um, and, and you know, kind of big geosynchronous payloads. Uh, you know, we're really you know, going after like, like PSLV, Vega, um, even Soyuz, uh, which is deploying a lot of the other kind of constellations that, that may be 
you know, in different markets than SpaceX or even like competing in some way with what they're doing with Starlink. Um, but uh, yeah, like that, that price point, um, we're actually being very competitive with even for larger rockets and then much smaller ones, you know, it's, it's far cheaper. Per satellite. Awesome. Um, and, and everybody in our, our chat room is basically asking, when are you guys launching your yeah, first yeah, rocket? Yeah. And I mean, that's like, ultimately, that is like the, the big question everyone always gets uh, when, you, yeah. when you're in a small uh, startup sort of space company. Yeah, like totally. That, so. Yeah, totally. Um, so right now, we're on track to launch in uh, like late 2020 for the first test launch. Um, and then commercial launches would be in early 2021. Um, that's, yeah, really, uh, uh, yeah, to, to actually get there, you know, the next steps are in uh, early 2019, we're actually doing a, a second stage hold down test. Um, so that's where you're taking like a fully printed, like full scale second stage tank, um, integrating a rocket engine, like our AN1 engine, this time with turbo pumps and valves and a lot of the other components to get it, you know, much closer to like a flight qualifiable version. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, you know, doing a ground test, which at that point, that's like the first like totally 3D printed like rocket stage um, ever tested like on the ground. And that's, yeah, that's like going to be a huge one yeah. as far as uh, checking the boxes towards flight. Oh boy, I look forward to that. Yeah. Um, so you recently did get an injection of funding into the yeah. company. Yeah. Um, what was that primarily for? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've, yeah, just, I guess, backing up for a bit. So mm -hmm. we started Relativity in December 2015. Um, it was kind of like, you know, me and Jordan said, all right, we're going to start our own company. <laughs> like a week later, uh, I cold emailed Mark Cuban and we actually got uh, $500,000 from him, like right literally like gate. right out of the gate. He was like just a week like, here, out take this, go yeah. do something yeah. with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a little harder than that. Um, I mean, he still asks like technical questions and yeah. he has like actually a really smart team to just like grill us on what we're doing. Um, and then we also got into a program called Y Combinator, uh, which is a startup accelerator in Silicon Valley. I'm kind of more famous for uh, seeding like Airbnb and Dropbox and Stripe and like Reddit uh, started there. You know, mm -hmm. all, all these kind of companies when they're just like two people in a garage, like trying to figure out what to do. Um, and so Y Combinator, or YC as, as people call it, um, was a really good entry point into Silicon Valley and kind of the venture capital ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, we do, you do this kind of program for like three months where, uh, you know, you actually need to make like a prototype and kind of start convincing investors to and like customers that this is worth investing in. Um, so it's still just me and Jordan, like kind of three months after we started the company, we had the money from Mark Cuban and YC, uh, and then we raised uh, $9.6 million for Series A. Um, with just us two and it's kind of funny mm -hmm. like in our pitch deck we have this slide where it was like an empty warehouse like <laughs> me and Jordan standing there and then like 10 million dollars in the bank account um, and we had made we made a prototype of Stargate it's actually called Gateway because gotcha. everyone knows you have to build the gateway before the, the Stargate, Stargate. Yeah, that's yeah, right. you got to you got to. that's the way it works in yeah, Starcraft yeah, so. yeah. Um, and so then we had yeah 10 million dollars we started uh, hiring our team mm -hmm. um, and then yeah just recently we closed another 35 million dollar series B so we've raised yeah. 40 to date, and yeah, that's let us fund the progress to this point. Can you just explain that process a little bit? Because um, yeah, I totally. mean, like, I know a lot of technical stuff about rockets, but I, I don't know anything about like getting capital for a startup and what that's like. Like, what, like, what are some of the what's some of the minutia that you have to deal with in doing things like that? Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, the the big one is just which kind of investors we're going after. So um, while while we have worked a lot with NASA. And you know, actually, like paid to use their test stand, and then we won a contract from them called a ACO or Announcement of Collaborative Opportunity. Like where they're paying for testing now, um, and then we did like the E4 CSLA agreement. Like really, all of our funding has been all private, um, and so a lot of it is just based in Silicon Valley, where like it's kind of the like hub of where venture <laughs> capital is in the United States. Um, I mean, there's VCs in LA and New York and other cities too, but Silicon Valley really does have like by far the most money. Um, and so the process is you just make uh, what's called a, a pitch deck. Um, and so that's really just, you know, a set of slides that kind of like sells the vision of what you're doing. And 
Um, VCs are really looking for you know companies that can actually be kind of like anomalous and and really make it to the point where they're like you know a multi-billion-dollar company in the future. Uh, and so you have to be doing something that's just like very very disruptive, um, and also showing progress and like like that you have a really good team um, and that you also know what you're doing. Like all these VCs, mm -hmm. um, they're like you know wicked wicked smart uh, financially and with business models, but they're also like very wicked smart technically. Um, like they actually will dive in and like look at the material science that we're doing. Like they'll look at like all of our financial plans and you just have to make just like models and models and models and yeah, it's like, it's a hell of a process. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds yeah, like it. Yeah, And yeah. I think my favorite part is that you said uh, becoming a multi-billion dollar company is anomalous. Yeah. But like in rocketry, anomalous, not the best word to use to describe. Oh, uh, true. Those anomalous things. in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> yes. In the best love, way. <laughs> I love how both of them are like completely diametrically opposite yeah. uh, of yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, in general, what's it like being a space startup? Because we've we've talked to space startups before, um, but like you guys have a lot of hardware and yeah. like not, uh, not necessarily flown hardware, but tested hardware. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's like super rare to find in a space startup nowadays yeah, yeah, because yeah. every anyone can announce that they're going to start building a small sat launcher but it really separates you from the field when you're like oh here's our engine and we fired it like a ton of times mm -hmm. and we've got a ton of data on it oh mm -hmm. by the way we built our own we built our own which just happens to be the largest 3d printer in the world yeah, so what yeah. is that like like sort of being on the on that on that beginning with you there yeah, uh, so it's a lot of coffee. I think that's maybe step one, <laughs> uh, like an insane amount. But but yeah, I mean, really, like truthfully, so the the way we've built the team and kind of recruited out, and, and really the development process we're doing, um, you know, I I like w like came from Blue Origin, like my co-founder was SpaceX. Like we've built the team out with a lot of like very very talented people from other like leading private space companies, um, and so kind of the pitch is like. Uh, you know, we've we've like seen from those companies like how launching rockets to orbit, like like with private, you know, kind of uh, private approach, like a much leaner approach works. Um, but we're really looking to like even disrupt that and, and kind of really, I would say, complement like the path of reusable rockets, which I think at this point is kind of showing itself. All right, like someone's definitely for sure like going to figure out how to make reusable rockets uh, really change the game as far as price um, and, and like getting more stuff to space. But then no one's still like really fundamentally innovated on the last, I would say even like 60 years of machining, forging, casting, you know, bending tubes, assembling it all by hand. Like we're still kind of doing that process. Um, and so yeah, being a startup now, it's really just like, you know, do you want to come like join something really early on that uh, we now have like a very long list of investors that believe is going to be like a multi-billion dollar company and and really like grow to be yeah, one of the leaders like in the launch space um, in the future. And so, yeah, it's a lot of uh, just getting the right talent and the right team. And um, and now we're building out like like we actually have like avionics and like GNC uh, teams that we're building, um, like launch operations, you know, sales, like all, all the kind of other parts that go into the business. And um, yeah, it kind of makes like time slow down actually because of the <laughs> amount of stuff you get done in like a day or like a week. Like you, you honestly kind of look back and you're like, like you feel like you've like been in the void or something where like <laughs> like literally stuff just like slowed down because you're like getting so much done. It's like kind of insane like how much is getting done. Uh, and, and I would say there's just like constant change too. Like the rule of thumb, so, so you asked more about like a startup. So the rule of thumb is every time you double, uh, kind of all of your like company processes like break and, and you really have to like rethink like how you know communication within the company works. I mean it's so it's really cool like being a quickly growing startup. Um, like right now we're at 23 people. Uh, we were at 14 uh, at the like only a few weeks ago. Um, and so you know with the funding round that helps uh, you yeah. get a lot more people applying. Um, but then from this point, like our goal is to be at 45 by the end of this year, and then like 90 uh, people by the end of 2019. And that's just getting to like a minimum viable skill set. Like you just need like people that know like avionics, hardware, software, like launch operations. Like it's kind of just like so so many different skill sets to make a rocket work. Um, that you need like people kind of focusing on each of those. But then beyond that point, and like really what what we're targeting is kind of 
after first launch and like how we actually scale um, to do more launches and like bigger rockets or even smaller rockets in the future. Um, that that's really what we're focusing on is like how to you know innovate on the design process, like supply chain, like manufacturing more rockets, but with the same factory and not necessarily having to go hire like a ton of like hands-on labor to do like all the different kind of parts and you know constant redesign and constant um, just like complexity because there's like so many parts that you have to redesign each time. Yeah, and actually, Mini Stoge, one of our correspondents, uh, was in the chat room saying was asked exactly what you just answered okay. right now, which is what's the kind of expertise that you're looking for yeah. um, at the moment. And I guess uh, we'll do one more question before we run into our final questions okay. um, that we do for every interview. And our final our final question from the chat room comes from To Wicked, um, which is, will you broadcast your first launches or keep them silent like Blue Origin? Oh man, what are you um, guys what are you guys thinking? Very first launch. Launches. Yeah, I, I can I can like non-definitively uh, say that. Yeah, I think o overall as a company, um, like we were in stealth mode for a while. That was really because mm. we wanted to launch out of stealth mode with like, hey, here's like our engine fired. Like we've already done it like a bunch of times. Like here's our 3D printer. Like this is actually the third version. We've already like made like two yeah. others before that. Um, and, and so you know, really like coming out of the gate with, with a lot of hardware and like a solid team. I think with the actual like launches, um, yeah, I mean we could potentially stream the first one. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's that's more of like something to be figured out as we get closer to it. But um, yeah, o overall again, like part of the goal of, of Relativity is to inspire other people to like want to join and, and like actually help out with the long term mission of uh, going to Mars and like actually uh, making humanity multiplanetary. So uh, if people want to know more about you and Relativity Space, where can they yep. go for that? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, other than our website and uh, the, a lot of the kind of news articles coming out now, um, yeah, just feel free to like shoot a message over to uh, uh, on our website. We have like a contact you form. Um, we do read those and, and get back to people uh, with any questions there. Um, and then also, uh, you could maybe do like what I did with uh, Mark Cuban. So I guessed his email address. It took like 20 <laughs> guesses. I can tell you mine is very easy to guess. Um, gotcha. So if you do want to like get in touch with me directly, I may I may regret saying that. We'll see how many messages yeah. I get. But uh, yeah, I mean, we'll I'll, I'll be down to like you know talk to people and if they have more uh, questions or want to learn more. Yeah. yeah. And that's at relativityspace.com. Yeah. Okay. Right. 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 Gotcha. Very very cool. All right, Tim. We have we we always end our interview with four questions um, okay. that we ask every guest. There's no right or wrong question. Um, it's just kind of what you come up with, and mm -hmm. we always like to ask this um, because it, it, we just get so many interesting answers from people that, it, mm -hmm. and they're all over the place. That so it's great. Yeah. Sure. Um, so the first one is, what is your favorite space mission, past, present, or future? Ah, oh, favorite space mission. I mean, th I think this is like a super easy answer, and it's probably like. The, the like easiest one, but Falcon Heavy with the Tesla was like pretty unreal. So uh, yeah. yeah, I just thought that was like the coolest thing ever. Yeah, that was like something yeah. out of like almost like a, a comedy movie. Yeah, um, it was, it's it, kind so. of, yeah part of it was kind <laughs> of a, uh, yeah, it was like an interesting um, uh, thing for us because actually on our website we have a Fiat 500 in our payload fairing. Yeah, I noticed it's like, that. Yeah, because so. it's like exactly <laughs> almost the like weight and size that fits. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, at one point I was like, hey, we should like actually just contact <laughs> Fiat and be like, hey, do you want to launch a car to space? But that was before then Elon said we're launching Tesla. And I was like, oh, well, at that point, there's there's no way. All right. Well, now we're just going to look like we're copying. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So second question, human or robot exploration of the cosmos? Um, I, I think it's definitely going to have to be both. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, yeah, if you just if you look at like kind of the, what are the rate limiting effects of of exploration, however, like humans like actually make it very hard. Like we yeah. are like we're we need yeah we need water, we yeah. need like food, we need air. We're like, needy. Yeah, yeah, so. and we get bored. Um, and yeah, so that too. Yeah, yeah, and so augmenting <laughs> that with um, robotics, I think. Uh, I, by the way, I think this is actually one of the like kind of things we're, we're fighting against as far as like time goes um, because sending like signals to Mars is actually much faster than sending people and as things like AI and and the like machine learning and these kind of algorithms and robotics on earth get much more uh, advanced then I think you know in the next like 50 years or, or less like having 
you know, robotics, like doing all of the exploration of, of other planets actually may be something that looks easier. Yeah. Um, even though maybe that's not exactly what we want. Um, we want like humans to be going. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean like for instance, Google just did a thing uh, with NASA Ames where they found, where they taught, uh, they did machine learning with one of their computers to find exoplanet uh, yeah. light curves in, yeah, yeah, in their stuff. Yeah. So yeah, that's a yeah. thing. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's kind of like though, if you want people to do it, like that's one of the reasons why we need to go very quickly um, so that you know people are also like part of part of it uh, yeah. yeah and uh, where should we go next where should we go next oh such an open-ended question um, <laughs> yeah yeah these are these are the tough yeah, ones right these are the tough ones um, where should we go next yeah, so I, I guess next meaning not like Mars or the moon. So yeah, I mean, I do think uh, I'm pretty excited b back a little bit on the missions question for a Europa mission. Mm -hmm. I think that would be super cool. Like, like just finding um, life on another planet in our lifetime would be yeah. like absolutely like, that would, bonkers. That's like paradigm changing. It's stuff, paradigm so. changing. Yeah, it's paradigm changing. And then my final question in our final question, which is why space? Why space? Uh, yeah, so I, I really definitely think um, it's kind of like why space, like why Mars as well. Like that's how I, I view it. Um, and the answer is, you know, the human story is kind of going to be limited at some point by by like what we can actually do on Earth. Um, and like if we were having this conversation right now and there were a million people living on Mars like permanently, um, first of all, like, yeah, this would probably be like a, a, even like a different conversation where uh, you know, if you're sitting at a cafe and like watching the news and like, you know, they're covering like what's going on in Mars and kind of throughout the solar system. Um, I just think that would be like a fundamental refocusing for people, um, mm -hmm. you know, a across the world. Uh, and with all the kind of stuff happening, you know, in the news and, and like kind of the increasing chaos of like modern life and, um, you know, especially with things like VR and AR, like I think our minds are about to get blown, uh, <laughs> is, like collectively blown as far as like the worlds we can go into um, and just having a continuation of the human story where like more emotions are possible and like more like things are possible uh, I just think is very important to actually uh, to do so awesome all right well Tim Ellis co-founder and CEO of Relativity Space thank you so much for coming on the show today this yeah. was such an awesome conversation to <laughs> yeah, have thank you. about the future of space flight and especially the future of 3d printing in space flight yeah all heck right. yeah all right, all right. and Coming up, we are going to have your comments from last week's show. So stay tuned. There's more tomorrow right after this. And welcome back to the conversation. Before we get into your questions and comments from last week's show, I want to give a huge thank you to our Escape Velocity citizens, our Orbital citizens, and of course, our Suborbital citizens. And these people contribute $2.50 per episode or $5 per month. And in return, they get their name in the third segment of the show, free US shipping from our Tomorrow Swag store, and so much more. Every bit helps, and we could not be able to continue making these awesome shows if it weren't for you guys. So for a complete list of rewards, or if you would like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. Now, last week, we spoke about uh, public to private space, uh, what the comparisons are, and what a private space sector could do better than government. Mm -hmm. So it was a, quite an interesting uh, discussion, roundtable discussion, and um, I had a lot of fun going through all the comments also. Um, so our first one comes off of YouTube from Michael Farrell. It says, thank you for your efforts to keep us informed. Media is so dumbed down, there is almost no coverage of space science news. You fill an empty niche that I truly find meets my desire to know about the greatest quest of all. And I love that. That made me really happy because that's like what we're all obviously passionate about. That's why this show even exists. And that's why we have you guys watching the show because it's about trying to translate what is happening in the space industry that honestly a lot of media doesn't really cover so much today. I think though there is quite 
uh, a movement now that we're. Do mm-hmm. you think more there's being more coverage by average media today of uh, like lo- rocket launches and different like uh, research that's being done out there? What do you, what do you guys think? If I if I can, I think that there definitely is, and it depends on what it is. Like, uh, of course, the Falcon Heavy was you know broadcasted everywhere, yeah. and that was amazing to see that on every single channel. But um, I remember um, back in 2016 when um, Goes R was launched. Uh, that was quite a big deal, and mm-hmm. mainly because a lot of like uh, um, weather newscasters were really excited about having better. Um, weather forecasting data than uh, what we had previously been using. Um, and aside from that, like a lot of times that the different probes and stuff, uh, interplanetary probes are, are launched, that's kind of a big deal. Although I didn't see as much um, mainstream media coverage for the InSight launch as I did for, for previous ones. But I mm-hmm. definitely think that there is starting to be more than there was in the past, although it's still kind of miscommunicated in in some ways depending on what the outlet is and who's mm-hmm. talking about it but i'm just happy to see it, um, more stuff being put out there and your basic everyday person um at least has heard of spacex at this point so i'm really happy about that at the very least yeah i feel like uh, a lot of it is that uh the people who are involved in space flight are just sort of uh, getting a little more charismatic mm-hmm. um than they mm-hmm. used to be yeah um we're kind of seeing that space flight is not necessarily the the realm of uh, people in white shirts thin black ties and pocket protectors anymore um so um so that's been helping and i feel like also like mainstream attention on like science fiction stuff and things like that is, is also helping with that too because yeah. i mean like mm-hmm. the biggest science movies fiction. nowadays it's i mean Star Wars is basically the biggest, most <laughs> profitable franchise you could possibly even <laughs> yeah. think of at the moment. Yeah. Um, so things like that really, really help it. Oh, so. yeah. And especially with, I mean, I know we're talking about like mainstream and conventional media, but social media, too, has really propelled, pun intended, um, getting some more space and launch news kind of into, you know, the public's awareness and whatnot Mm -hmm. and I think that that inevitably does leak into conventional media because you can't really ignore what millions of people are talking about or what's trending on Twitter yeah exactly cool awesome well I like also a lot of your comments I'm seeing in the chat right now we have uh, Uncle Bill Drulin uh, from Twitch and he says when regular media does cover science topics they all do it often do it completely wrong and what I think is interesting about that I mean I do want to give credit. There are some newscasters out there that do get a lot of the science right. But yeah. what I wonder is, like, okay, now the question is, how do we start to fix that in a sense? Is it getting more scientists on television? Is it trying to conduct more interviews? I think, for instance, having the show in itself is, is one thing. It's really yeah. trying to reach the broader audience. And I think, uh, actually, social media is a big impact that's being made outside of regular traditional media. Um, that's, I think, uh, really reaching a broader audience now. Yeah, we talked about that on a previous show, too. Oh, right? Nice. Wasn't that our topic cool. that we had on the show? I swear we had a roundtable about this. Yeah, yeah. we've had we've had uh, a few over over the years about uh, outreach and and uh, the effect of of social media on um, I guess the awareness of yes. of yeah. base play. Yeah, amazing, cool. I'm going to move on to our next comment. Uh, it comes off of YouTube from Ronak Mystery. It says, uh, "Will the CubeSats enter Mars orbit? If yes, how? I ask because if it is a relay." It has to be in orbit, and I find it hard to believe that a CubeSat has enough fuel to get it into orbit. So um, I actually did a bit of research on this, and I was at the, the launch itself for Inside, and we had some um, of the engineers there from the CubeSat mission for uh, Marcos, and the, the two are going to be uh, crossing past Mars just as uh, InSight is landing, as just as it's landing, because any data that's going to be retrieved as passing through Mars' atmosphere, it'll be sending that back to um, Mar- Marcos, um, the two Marcos, and it also is going to be in connections. Um, the same data is going to be sent for um, what was it? Uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, also. Mm-hmm. So they also will be picking it up. And uh, as far as the question about fuel, um, it's not going to be facing the sun. So, so it's also going to be relying on the batteries that are on board um, on the actual uh, CubeSats. So yeah. it's not actually going to be charged by by the sun or anything like that. But I think that's really cool because when it was launched with Atlas V, it was not just inside. I know you guys spoke about it last week, but also the, those two uh, cute cubes, CubeSats. Yeah. So. And those really CubeSats, cool. I don't think they, for, as far as fuel, I don't think they even have any sort of like liquid propellant for like even thrusters or anything like that. But even inside itself, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it entering into like a direct landing trajectory? It's yes. not even yes. going to be entering into orbit. Yeah. yeah. 
So right when it's a, going into that landing is when uh, the two uh, Marcos are going to be picking up any data retrieved mm -hmm. as it's passing through the atmosphere and then lands um, safely, hopefully, <laughs> which would be great. Yeah, and that's because uh, when Mars Polar Lander uh, mm -hmm. attempted its landing in 1999, they didn't have real-time te well, real um, <laughs> telemetry coming from it. So they, when they tried to figure out what went wrong with it, they didn't actually have any data that could help them figure mm -hmm. that out. Um, right. So that became a requirement at that point after that um, for NASA missions that you have to have real-time telemetry coming back um, mm -hmm. from a Mars mission, even on entry, you know, right. even with like what they call the Doppler tones, which is shifting of the radio signals because the spacecraft is decelerating in the atmosphere. Um, so that's why that became a, a necessary requirement um, from them was because when Mars Polar Lander didn't land on Mars, we <laughs> didn't have anything that said yes or no. no. We, yeah, yeah. Rest in peace, maybe. Good guess, <laughs> good guess. Maybe. Yeah. So, oh, wow, yeah. so awesome. that was the Polar Lander that, that yes. that's why we have the telemetry. Okay, mm -hmm. nice. Yep. Very cool. Awesome. So uh, our next comment comes um, also off of YouTube from John Burr, and he asks, I've been thinking, before SpaceX sends the first 200 people to Mars, we who hope to be among them need to start discussing what the socio-political environment should look like. The colony can't hmm. belong to any country here on Earth, so it even has to be self-sustaining in that way, too. When does that conversation start? And I know you guys were discussing that also last week. That got really cool. So I want to hear your thoughts on that one. As far as that Who would goes. like to go first? Go ahead, Mike. You, go. <laughs> you uh, first, Mike. You're scratching um, your chin. I feel <laughs> like um, if SpaceX goes alone, it's going to be some sort of weird in between because it being like a private venture, I guess. Um, but more likely, especially if they're the first people to go to Mars, this is going to be, you know, uh, there's going to be government involvement, just not just from the United States, but from probably the entire United Nations. And as a colony grows, like I foresee some sort of, you know, Earth um, dominance over over that colony. And it's not even going to be like a problem until we're talking about tens of thousands or even millions of people living on Mars where directives from from Earth no longer make any sense. Um, however, if it is some sort of private venture, that's a very good question of, you know, what exactly is that? Is it, in, is it its own independent colony and will it have sovereign powers and, you know, is SpaceX going to have its own country essentially on Mars? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Werner von Braun's book about uh, colonizing uh, Mars talks about having a, a leader uh, of the Martian colony, and the leader's name should be the Elon. So I find that very a very odd <laughs> coincidence that Elon Musk is the one pioneering that whole thing. But yeah, it's a good I, question, and it could go either way. But I, I think that it's going to be a lot of government involvement from international uh, uh, governments here on Earth that will kind of be directing that. That's just my opinion, though. Yeah, I guess it also depends on, too, like, who really starts the, the first colonies, like, which country. Because if it's going to be a very collaborative effort, then, of course, it's going to be more of a collaborative uh, colony that will really start to form um, as far as, like, government-wise. Um, but I guess it really just sort of depends on who's going to be the first ones to really get there. That's, that'll be the deterring factor, I think, um, and then once they're there. Mm -hmm. But uh, I did see a comment in the chat, which is pretty, <laughs> from, from Carrie Ann, actually. Um, hello. And she says that no one can tell you what to do on Mars as there's no one on Mars to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. I thought that was, like, that was, that was quite yes. poetic. <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> yeah, I feel like uh, that first 200 people on Mars, the, the priority is going to be survival, um, yes. not necessarily who should be governing who. Nice cities. Uh, and, uh... <laughs> and, um, and I also feel like with Mike uh, that, that uh that space agencies are going to basically, I th feel like on that first seat, um, NASA and a few other space agencies are going to buy seats for yes. their astronauts to go as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be like this really interesting public-private uh, kind of collaboration um, with that in there. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like the, the initial governance on Mars or the socio-political environment, or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a lot like Antarctica and how that's being handled um, mm -hmm. and uh, and things like that. So um, essentially not necessarily a, a lack of territorial claims, um, but all of these countries uh, collaborating together in order to make an outpost work correctly. Exactly. Because um, so, like, like ultimately yeah. survival is the the 
goal <laughs> yeah. in those ideal. first couple of rounds <laughs> of yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Establishment and survival. Absolutely. Uh, those are going to be the driving factors initially. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like we almost aren't going to be able to talk about a socio-political environment until we actually like Can have the people down. there. Yeah. And then who knows what's going to happen after that. Um, yeah. It could end up being governance people. from Earth. Um, you could have a moon is a, a moon, or Mars is a harsh mistress, uh, I guess, yes. at that point. <laughs> I know. Um, you know, there ain't no such thing as a free exactly. uh, greenhouse. I don't know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we'll yeah. just we'll figure that out and it, uh, I think at that it, point. It's exciting, too, because, like, as you said, obviously, like, survival and actually making sure we have a colony that can last on Mars is probably yes. important objective number one. But um, as, you know, we, as our technologies evolve and as we get it, quote unquote, right, um, it's going to be interesting because I feel like it's going to be kind of like a whole paradigm shift. It's going to be like the next step of evolution when it comes to governance in general. Mm -hmm. um, because you're right, it's a collaborative effort, but it's, it's off planet Earth. And at that point, um, you kind of have no choice but to, you know, it's taking it to the next level in terms of like, um, I mean, obviously, I'm sure there's inevitably going to be certain divides like, well, you know, this is mm -hmm. our little American faction. This is the Russian faction, whatever. Yeah. Um, but overall, it's going to be right. interesting to see how all of that kind of evolves. And yeah. it's going to be like a whole I new, feel like, like that factioning can't happen. Because if you with the International Space Station, you can't have a faction. That's on what there. I was thinking too. Uh, yeah. Because the because is a the, those segments are all dependent upon each other working exactly. together. If one segment doesn't work with the other, it's toast, and uh -huh. yeah. you got to evacuate everybody and get off of there. Absolutely. So, yeah. so everything has to work together. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just it's it's. It, I mean, it's just yeah. it's just the way it's, it's going to be exactly, because survival yeah. doesn't care what country you come from. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Exactly. But the only thing that I was thinking of is like you know once we <laughs> do. Uh oh. Sorry, <laughs> especially when the toilet goes down. Yeah. Oh, that is so. the true D Day. <laughs> yeah. American I mean, toilets, not so good. Oh, so. man. Really? Just Russian ones, though, spot on. <laughs> Pretty good. So. Nice. Awesome. Cool. So uh, for our last uh, comment from last week's show, it comes off of Twitch. It is uh, Astro Yeez, um, and it says, So, ULA, Blue Origin, and SpaceX all want to send lots of humans to space to live. Any corporation there? So I'm guessing more of like as far as like a collaboration Ooh, yes. between them. Huh. What do you guys think? Well, yes I know. Um, so as far as ULA's plan, they're collaborating with Bigelow Aerospace for the habitats. They're also co uh, collaborating with Maston Aerospace for landers. They're also collaborating with Blue Origin for the engines mm -hmm. for uh, Vulcan and uh, launching off in the first place. And just announced this week, they're collaborating with Aerojet Rocketdyne for the engines for their ACES upper stage. Um, and I believe they're, they've been in talks with other companies like uh, Maiden Space and NanoRacks for um, you know, some of the kind of smaller uh, capabilities that they might need for uh, some of the first pieces of hardware to set up propellant depots. So as far as ULA and the Cislunar 1000 plans, yes, there's lots of collaboration going on there. As far as SpaceX and some of their plans, um, seems like their only collaboration has mainly been with uh, NASA and getting a lot of data from, from NASA. Um, I, unless you guys know of anything, I don't haven't heard of any cooperation mm -hmm. with like uh, life support companies or any other companies really that would be able to, to further um, that goal of colonization along. No, I mean, uh, all, all, to me, all three of these companies, uh, United Launch Alliance, Blue Origin, and SpaceX, they all have uh, three completely separate end games, and, it, and yeah, their, exactly. their cooperation doesn't necessarily make sense because cooperating with each other would be a distraction to what they actually yeah. want to do. Yeah. So... Um, and uh, I also feel like that's a good thing that they all have three different ideas of what they want to do. Yeah. Um, you know, ULA wants to do their Cislunar 1000 plan. Um, Blue Origin is probably going to be a part of that enabling lunar architecture. Um, and then SpaceX, we know their goal, humans on Mars. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, they may stop by the moon on the way to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but also SpaceX has those big goals of, of uh, the internet constellation here around Earth as well. Yeah. That's going to, it, it's essentially fund an enable um, them going to Mars. So, I mean, that's that's it. So <laughs> Yeah, I think the main, like, any type of collaborations that either of these companies would have would, wouldn't so much be with each other, but with um, companies that are actually looking to plan the colonization on, like, maybe on Mars or, like, other parts that 
wherever these uh, the other companies actually want to go to. So mm -hmm. as far as like like the space hotel and yeah. you know like stuff like that. So I think that's more so the, the type of collaborations that would be happening because again they're really focused on the transportation aspect as opposed to the actual like settling or settlement aspect. Um, so yeah, more, so it's interesting. And there was something more funny. More like a customer supplier type of relationship. Yes, mm -hmm. precisely. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, that was a funny joke I saw in here. I just want to talk about real quick from Marty the Martian, ULABO, and SpaceX walk into a bar. I dare all of you guys to continue that joke and come up with something really funny after that. Um, I yeah. think that'd be really cool. Awesome. <laughs> Cool. Well, that about wraps up um, the today's show. So uh, before we go, we want to recognize our uh, ground support citizens. These people contribute $1 per episode or $1 per month. And in return, they get access to After Dark as soon as it's posted on demand, access to our exclusive citizen-only hangouts, and so much more. Every bit helps, and we would not be able to continue making these awesome shows, really, if it weren't for you guys. So for a complete list of rewards, or if you would like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. And next week, <laughs> we will be talking with Mariam Saloum about Space Up Seattle. What is Space <sighs> Up and how to make your own <laughs> Space Up? What? So this sounds really A Space really Up cool. in Seattle? Yeah. Uh-oh, sounds, sounds like it's time awesome. for a trip. Yes. Oh, yeah. Let's totally take it on the road. Tomorrow goes to Seattle. Okay. No, but Seattle's <laughs> more so coming to us. So definitely <laughs> tune in next week. And thank you so much for watching. We will talk with you guys later. Stay tuned for After Dark. Bye. Bye.